technology constantly makes work easier, but it also makes workers redundant. Does new technology in the workplace put people out of work, or is there something else going on? With me is David Seymour from the Frontier Center for Public Policy. There's something intuitive about the observation that new technology can replace people and put them out of work. For example, telephone exchanges employed thousands of people who connected calls, but now calls are generally directed with no humans involved in the connection. Well, certainly, that's one example, and you know, there's been countless examples throughout human history. Uh, right now, self-serve checkouts at grocery stores are allowing one store worker uh, to supervise you know, half a dozen people uh, doing the work that used to take 10 extra employees. And historically, workers have sometimes reacted with hostility, even violence, to new technology. Um, during the Industrial Revolution, for example, some workers rioted um, and smashed the, the new machinery that they saw as stealing their jobs. However, in the long run, they didn't save any jobs, and they actually made everybody poorer. That seems like a contradiction. You're saying that people made themselves poorer by keeping their jobs. Well, that they might have saved their jobs in the very short term, but a look at the long-term economic history shows that they shouldn't have worried about long-term unemployment. Uh, they definitely shouldn't have destroyed labor-saving devices. Uh, in 1800, 95% of the U.S. workforce was employed in agriculture in some way. Uh, almost the only thing the economy did back then was produce food. Uh, by 1900, agriculture employed about 40% of the workforce. Today, about 3% of the population in the United States and in Canada uh, works in agriculture. So, you know, by that logic, we, we should now have about 55% unemployment by 1900, and we should have uh, almost total unemployment today because all of the jobs that existed in 1900 uh, are just about gone, except for the 3% of people still in agriculture. But we clearly don't have that much unemployment, so something else is going on. That's fine as an observation, but it's still obvious that there are fewer people employed in agriculture today. Here in Saskatchewan, this has led to the decimation of rural communities. That's certainly true in that there's been a massive urbanization over the last century, uh, and it's not hard to see why. I mean, one of my favorite things to do here in Regina uh, is to go to Agribition and see the gigantic machines that have replaced so much hard manual labor. Uh, for example, there are plowing and seeding machines that allow a single worker to do what uh, used to require dozens of workers. And that's why there are fewer people uh, needed on farms, but it's also part of the reason why more people now work in cities. Uh, many people who did the manual labor are now employed uh, building machinery that does the work. Uh, so the technology that made some jobs redundant also created new ones. But that alone can't explain where all the jobs went. If it did, how would a farmer save labor costs by investing in new technology if it makes just as many people manufacture the machines? Well, you, you know, you, you're right about that. It is an important point that the same work is being done by fewer people. Uh, each worker is now producing more value, and that means the worker can be paid more uh, because there is more product per worker to sell. But if a farmer or other employer is adopting technology to save labor costs, then surely not all of the efficiency gains are taking up and more pay for the workers producing the machines. Well, you're right about that too. Not all of the labor savings uh, are absorbed by higher wages for the people producing the technology. Otherwise, there'd be no advantage uh, in moving to more technology because the labor costs would be the same. Uh, the gains have to be shared with the employer uh, who purchases the technology. Otherwise, he or she wouldn't buy it. Uh, so there is additional profit for the purchaser of the labor-saving machinery. So the producers of the new technology are better off, and the purchaser of the new technology is better off. In keeping with the theme of looking at long-term economic effects in all groups, where does this leave the people who lost their jobs to create the labor savings in the first place? Well, they benefit from some secondary effects too. For one thing, as the entire industry adopts the new technology, the competitors compete away the labor savings uh, by offering lower prices on their products. This competition leads to lower prices for consumers. For example, when clothes were typically made by hand, most people had only a few outfits, maybe a couple for work and one for formal occasions. Today, better technology means clothes are produced cheaply. Uh, people talk about their wardrobe, and they do things like buy t-shirts just to celebrate special Which events. Which is still not helpful if you don't have any money because you lost your job to new technology. No, but there are still other uh, secondary effects that mean you're more likely to find a job. Uh, because goods get cheaper, employed workers have more money and therefore more disposable income. Uh, employers have more profits, at least until they're competed away 
uh, by people who are offering lower prices. So this extra money is ultimately fed into more job creation. Unless people put more money under their mattresses, chances are that they're either going to spend it or invest it. If they spend it, then they're creating demand for more goods and services, which means more jobs. And if they invest it, then they provide for more technology to make those jobs more efficient. And so it goes in an endless cycle of new job creation with more machinery to work with and therefore more production. It's still a difficult transition if you lose your job. Oh, sure it is. And that's why people have reacted violently to new machinery uh, in the past. However, there are two reasons why the situation is not as bad as it sounds. Firstly, the change is not usually sudden. We didn't go to 3% of the workforce in agriculture from 95% overnight. It actually took 200 years, uh, which is seven or eight generations. And secondly, you've got to look at what it's done to living standards. In 1800, uh, the life expectancy was only 40, even in the most advanced economy of that time, which was Great Britain. Um, when 95% of the workforce produces food, that's almost all it can produce. Thanks to new technology, most of those people are now producing additional wealth, building flying airplanes, uh, practicing medicine, building better houses, and so on. So it's a case of a rising tide lifts all boats. Well, I think you have to be careful when applying those kinds of sweeping aphorisms. Uh, but technology has certainly lifted living standards without raising unemployment. We can see that just from the evidence of the last 200 years. Even groups that haven't benefited directly from technology have profited from its secondary effects. If you take hairdressing, or at least the kind of hairdressing that I get, um, th th there hasn't been any technological improvement in that business for over 100 years. Uh, nevertheless, because technology has increased the earning power of hairdressers' customers, they can now afford to charge more for their services. If you're a hairdresser today, you can afford things that hairdressers 100 years ago couldn't even imagine. So in the final analysis, a new technology in the workplace brings change. Uh, it's disruptive for the people directly affected in the short term, but it is highly beneficial for all people in the long term. To summarize, new technology in the workplace displaces some workers in the short term. However, it creates new employment for people to make the labor-saving technology. It also creates surplus wealth for employers and the remaining workers, which in turn creates new investment and demand, which leads to new jobs. In our next episode, we look at the wider implications of job creation schemes. Do schemes aimed at spreading work around improve employment, or are they undermined by perverse consequences? Until then, I'm Jamie Stevenson, and this has been On the Other Hand.